time for us to rank another discography, and I may actually have a title for this series if that's what it's set to become. Rank them all! Okay, that is a name that is just as lame as I am. Maybe if I do Slayers, I should just call it Rank and Blood. I'm still searching for a title is basically what I'm saying, but we are going to rank them all today. This is the top 10 Metallica albums of all time, and there is one thing that I need to discuss before getting into number 10. Now, there are technically 11 studio albums that Metallica has been a part of, and that last sentence is very critical, considering Lulu has been debated for, well, ever since that it was released, that's my true Metallica album since it was a collaboratory effort between Metallica and Lou Reed. So for that purpose, to sort of satisfy them, I suppose, we're going to leave that off the list, and it's mainly because we kind of know where it would be anyway. So we're not going to worry about that, we're going to leave that to the side, so on with the show. Number 10 is Saint Anger, and once again, we kind of knew where this was going to fall. But the difference between Saint Anger and Lulu is the fact that 15 years after its release, this is an album that if you revisit, it's definitely going to give you some different feelings. You're not going to have that same element of anger that you did whenever it were uh, first dropped or the first time that you heard the title track on the radio. This is instead an album that feels very much for the moment and one where their evolution uh, or de-evolution in the eyes of some had taken its final turn uh, right after the new millennium had came out. After this, they ditched Bob Rock and they decided to go a different route with everything that they were doing, and things that have come since then have been a little bit different, that's certainly to say. However, St. Anger was an album that definitely moved some mountains in the fields of sales, I suppose, but also in the fields of disappointing a lot of long-term fans. Number nine is Load. This is part of the Load and Reload cycle. Whenever I did the Metallica discography, I stated that if you took certain songs off of Load and certain songs off of Reload and put them together, you'd have a heck of a good album. Load has some terrific tracks, such as The House That Jack Built, Bleeding Me, and even to a certain extent, tracks that you hear on the second half also are no slouches. However, one of the things that certainly hampers this album a bit is the fact that it only has those couple of good songs. So whenever you go back, even if you're just aiming to listen to a couple of tracks instead of the entire affair of Load, it's one where you find yourself skipping around quite frequently. I know that I'm guilty of this. Number eight is Death Magnetic, and some may be shocked that this is so low on the list, considering many would say that it's the logical progression between the uh, Black Album and Injustice for All. Only reverse that, because history doesn't operate in reverse, uh, unless it wants to, I guess. Time travel is fun. Where's Marty McFly? Whenever this album dropped, it certainly gave a lot of fans a little bit of a sigh of relief that the band still had the capability to write some pretty decent music after St. Anger kind of boggled their minds. However, this was an album that also has a similar problem as Load does that we just mentioned, and it's the fact that, really, it's an album that I don't return to all of that often. It's not one that whenever I'm sitting down and saying, I'd like to listen to some Metallica, I think, yeah, Death Magnetic, that'll work. Well, unfortunately, based around that, it's not one that's long for the memory. And the songwriting and some of the other quirks that the album does unfortunately possess also leaves it this low on the list. Number seven is Reload, which some people will probably be shocked is above Death Magnetic. Out of the two Load and Reload cycles, this is the one that I find myself going to quite often. Not only was this my first Metallica album, one of my very first heavy metal albums, don't judge, you guys all started somewhere, you know, at one point as well, and I bet you it was pretty lame, Linkin Park, but at any rate, this is an album that certainly has, like Load, a lot of, you know, semi-decent tracks on it, and I definitely remember the second half of this disc being a more emotional ride than anything that I had heard in quite some time. With tracks such as Where the Wild Things Are and Low Man's Lyric representing things very different about Metallica sound, but things I also kind of dug. You know, these were experiments that certainly didn't appease the long-term fans. But for somebody just coming in, Metallica seemed like this wonderland of whatever, you know? They could essentially do whatever they wanted. And essentially that's what the band has done. So Reload is at number seven. Number six, we have The Black Album. Another shock, maybe? Well, this is seen as one of the pinnacle albums of heavy metal. It's the best-selling metal album of all time, and certainly should be higher on the list. It should be number one for that reason, correct? Well, this is an album that's certainly solid, and it's one that whenever you listen to it, it's very easy to listen to it all the way through. However, whenever compared to some of the other great magnificent works that Metallica has given us, and really had given us to that point, it's one that felt a little bit weaker. Really, whenever this album came out, if I did a top five list, it would be at number five. 
and it's simply because a lot of the material that they had produced prior to that just seems, and really was, very untouchable. However, the Black Album still maintains itself as one of the most important albums in heavy metal history, considering all of the influence that it was able to collect. Not to mention, it brought heavy metal to a large section of the mainstream once again, considering it was bought and consumed by so many people. Number five, we have And Justice For All, the first Jason Newsted album, the first in the uh, post-Cliff Burton era, and one that has some weird quirks to it. This is a very well done album. It's written very tightly, has a lot of long songs, and of course features the uh, trademark single, One, on it. However, this is also an album that is a bit doomed by the fact that its bass is a little bit low, and overall, the songwriting just doesn't feel quite as tight as the three albums that preceded. it. Either way, and Justice For All is still considered a bona fide classic, however on this list, it only makes the cut at number 5. That's because of number 4, which is Garage Incorporated. You might have wondered what was the odd album out whenever we started this. Well, I'm including Garage Incorporated for a very good reason. It is essentially a studio album, even though it's covers, it's not original material, but there's two discs worth of covers here! There's a lot of stuff here. We're not going to include S&M, because it, it's a neat idea, but anyway. Garage Incorporated is extremely important and near and dear to my heart, which is part of the reason why it is so high on this list, but also it showcased Metallica's diversity. Whenever Load and Reload dropped, this was something that was still somewhat new or somewhat infuriating to some fans. However, to hear some of these great old classic songs played in Metallica's tone to really showcase the, really where heavy metal had once been and how, how far it's really come ever since its release, which was in 1998 roughly, it definitely was a marvelous sight. This was an album that also was paramount in helping me find a lot of other heavy metal bands to check out because this album was released somewhat amid my early formative years within the genre. Either way, this is an album that has one of the most important uh, real discoveries for me on it as well, and that's Merciful Fate. Thanks to the 10 minute Merciful Fate medley, I scoped out King Diamond and Merciful Fate both. Originally could be considered some of the first forays into occult metal or what would later become known as extreme metal, and really, the rest is history. Look at where we are now. Number three, Kill Em All, the debut album by Metallica and one that certainly holds high regard within my heart for a couple of its keynote properties. The first of which is the fact that this is a very dirty sounding album. It's not very cleanly produced. It's instead one that feels like it's capturing the moment of youths going into the studio and recording their first songs. And really, it has to be stated, some of these songs are really, really freaking good. To the point they are still mainstays on their live shows. It's to the point that some of this material is so strong and so well remembered that there would be probably a lot of people that would love to see Cliff Burton return as a hologram just so he could play the bass in Anesthesia, just so they could hear that again on the live setting. Either way, this is an album that's exceptionally important. It's the beginning of the legend, and also the material on it is still top notch. That brings us to number two, which is Master of Puppets. Really, Metallica was a band that, during their 1980s run, wrote four masterpieces. However, they only wrote two albums that are basically as close to perfection as you could possibly be, or absolute perfection. This is about as close as it gets, and this is definitely an album that, for most people, would be considered their number one. However, Master of Puppets just pales a little bit, very, very slightly in comparison to our number one title, which you could probably already guess, which is Ride the Lightning. So we'll discuss both of them concurrently. These two albums definitely represent Metallica's pinnacle. It also showcases the evolution of some elements of thrash metal. It's something where there's longer song patterns, even uh, with these, those very aggressive riff patterns, were certainly very inspirational to some of the bands that would follow within the second and third tier generations of thrash metal. And based around that, their influence is collectively magnificent and enormous. Master of Puppets is a little bit more of the clean album that has a little bit more of that polish behind it. This is a band that certainly was tailoring their songcraft, and really the title track by itself is evidence of that, and it's still played on the radio frequently to this day. However, Ride the Lightning still having a little bit of that, you know, real unpolished exterior to it, and some of the strongest songwriting I've ever heard from this band being present on this disc, even with songs such as Trapped Under Ice or Escape being present, which I still actually consider to be pretty damn good songs. Wow. How is it hard, so hard to, you know, not think of Ride the Lightning as the true victor. This is a track whose first half is absolutely legendary, and it's an uh, album also that finishes exceptionally strong with its final two cuts, with A Call of Cthulhu, that instrumental to end the album, 
being a very bold declaration, not to mention a bold experiment at the time, and one that certainly paid off. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the Metallica album is ranked from 10 to 1. 10 to 1. Wow, that was weird. Didn't intend to do that. Did you agree with this list? You probably don't. So let me know your list in the comments below. My name is Cover Killer Nation, and if you think there's another band that needs to have their albums ranked, leave your suggestion. This may become a full-fledged thing. Who knows? Take care.